All right, so here it is, Stokes' theorem. What is this theorem? All right, so let S be an oriented, which, which is bounded <coughs> by a simple closed <coughs> Uh, piecewise smooth, simple, closed, piecewise smooth, uh, curve C. Oh, dash, curve C. Okay? So, the, all this piecewise stuff just means you can kind of patch a surface together. Like, it can have corners or something. All right? <clears throat> All right, and then, and give C the orientation induced by S. All right, so this is the one where you, if you walk around C with your head in the direction of the orientation, the unit normal vector, then the surface is on your left. I realize this is a very spaced out B here. Yep. Okay. All right, now we're going to let F be a vector field on R3, right, so 3D vector field, right, which is, is C1 on an open uh, <coughs> region containing S, okay? Then what do we get? Then, if we integrate over the boundary of the surface, F dot DS, if we integrate that, what we can do is switch this boundary here, right, because C is the boundary of S. So let me just say we can write this as this. Oops. Why am I writing big S here? Get ahead of myself. I just want to do flux integrals, apparently. This should be dr. Okay. <clears throat> right. So then the line integral around the boundary is equal to the integral over the surface of the curl of F dot ds. All right. So the curl is a type of derivative, essentially. Right. C is the boundary of S. So again, remember what we did in Green's theorem. Remember what we did in fundamental theorem of line integrals. Re remember what you do in the fundamental theorem of calculus. You're always switching a boundary for a derivative, or vice versa, derivative for a boundary. Right? So that's this theme of Stokes theorem, is it's always switching derivatives for boundaries. Right? So this is going to be a useful way to help us compute line integrals or surface integrals, or flux integrals, right? So let's go ahead and get this off the board and do an example. All right, let's revisit an example we did in the previous section on flux integrals, right? So we computed the flux of this vector field, which was given as the curl of some vector field, all right? So <clears throat> remember, that actually took quite a bit of work to do. Well, what we're going to do now is sort of do it an easier way. We're going to use Stokes there. Right? So let's recall what this surface looks like. <coughs> right? So it's an upside down paraboloid that's cut off by a plane. So it looks something sort of like this. Right? So here, so let's draw in some axes real quick. 
Actually, let's draw one more band here just to kind of give it some more depth. Right. So remember, this thing is at z equals 1, so our axes might look something like this. x, y, z. Right, so up here is z equals 5, here is z equals 1, right? Because it's cut off by the plane z equals 1, right? Then what does the orientation on this look like? <coughs> well, it's with the upward orientation, so it's an orientation that looks something like this, right? So it's kind of the spikes coming out of the helmet thing. All right. So what kind of orientation does that induce on the boundary? Well, it means we must be going around, so let's highlight the boundary here. Must me, it means we must be going around this way, right? Because if we walk along the surface here with our head pointing in the normal direction of that guy, then if we walk in this counterclockwise way, the surface is on our left, right? So if you view this surface from above, like stand really high up on the z-axis, say at z equals 10 or something, and look down at it, you'll see a counterclockwise orientation, okay? So, well, what is the boundary of this surface? Well, the boundary of the surface is given by the intersection of these two guys. So what is that? So, well, we do know that z is equal to 1, z is equal to 1, but it's also equal to this, 5 minus x squared minus y squared. And this tells us that actually x squared plus y squared equals 4, right? So the boundary is given by the circle x squared plus y squared equals 4 together with z equals 1, right? Because if we don't specify that z equals 1, this gives us a whole cylinder. So if we specify z equals 1, that says I want that slice of the cylinder, which gives me that circle right there. All right, <clears throat> so now we need to parameterize the boundary. And we need to parameterize it so that it goes in a clockwise or counterclockwise way when viewed from above. Well, <clears throat> We know how to parameterize a circle in a counterclockwise way. That just uses uh, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, right? So to parameterize that boundary, so boundary of s, this is given by, let's say, r of t, right? Now the radius of the circle is 2, so we get 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, but then what about z? Well, remember, here z is always 1. So this is a parameterization of the boundary, right? And then, of course, t goes from 0 to 2 pi. All right? Okay, so that shouldn't be too tough. Hopefully that all makes sense, right? And then now, what we have is this integral that we wanted to compute originally. Right? We've reduced this using Stokes' theorem. So actually, let me write up here, just a little reminder. This was Stokes' theorem, okay? That gives us the integral over the boundary of S. Now, F, remember, F is the curl of G. And Stokes' theorem takes this curl G and turns it into just G dr, right? Now we're down to just a regular line integral or a work integral, <clears throat> okay? So now we just do the usual uh, setup here. So this is an integral from 0 to 2 pi. g is this, so we need to plug r into g. That gives us uh, negative 2 times 2 sine t times 1, so negative 4 sine t, right? Just y here, so 2 sine t, and 3x, so 
6 cosine t. Right? Dot product with r prime, so uh, minus 2 sine t, 2 cosine t, 0 dt. Okay? Oh, it's a little off the edge of the screen there. Let's see if I can squish that in a bit. Okay. So now just do this. Right? So this is an integral from 0 to 2 pi of 8 sine squared. plus 4 sine t cosine t right, plus 0. So just this, dt. Right? So now we just have to integrate that. Remember sine squared t is 1 half 1 minus cosine 2t. So 0 to 2 pi of so that just becomes 4 minus 4 cosine 2t plus 4. So actually, <clears throat> let's do a little trick here to make this a little easier. Remember what, there's another trig identity. 2 sine t cosine t is the same as sine 2t. So 2 sine 2t. Now you could do this by just doing a u substitution with u equals sine, but let's do this to just kind of write down on the writing we have to do here. All right, so we're integrating from 0 to 2 pi. We're integrating cosine 2t, which has period pi. So we're integrating this over two full periods, so that's 0. Same thing here, sine 2t has period pi, and we're integrating it over two full periods, so that's, again, 0. So the only thing we actually have to integrate here from 0 to 2 pi is 4. Right? And that just gives us 8 pi. All right? So that's all there is to that. And as you can see, using Stokes' theorem on this has cut down a whole bunch of work. We never actually had to find the orientation on the surface, which usually takes a little bit of work. right? I mean, you'll have to parameterize the boundary, but that's usually also not so bad, right? But there, so there's a lot less steps in the end when you do it this way, all right? So hopefully this shows you some of the usefulness of Stokes' theorem, and well, let's keep going and do some more examples. See you there.